Um, thank you, Dirk, uh, for the intro, and thank you all for coming. Um, okay. So I want to start by acknowledging uh, the funding agency, um, my co-PI, Erica Middleton, uh, my ex-postdoc, Abhijit Patra, who is now faculty in England, and my current postdoc, Anna Crayson, uh, and my ex-grad student, Kelly Scherer, who is now goes by Kelly Marshall, and um, several undergraduate, uh, undergraduate and graduate research assistants and um, collaborators in the Netherlands. Okay, so um, the main ideas in the talk are as follows. Um, so selection and inhibition processes that help choosing between competing representations are useful for sentence comprehension, and that understanding this interaction between selection processes and comprehension can aid characterization of persons with aphasia. These processes can also be a target for treatment for some PWA, and a recurrent theme in this talk is going to be uh, on how studying variability is important. Uh, so variability in comprehension mechanisms, I would argue, is typical in both neurotypicals as well as PWA. And understanding this variability can enhance characterization and lead to new um, treatments. So let me begin with some background uh, terminology and paradigms and so on. Um, so cognitive control um, is I'm using the term cognitive control to refer to detecting and resolving conflict between competing representations. And it's, uh, this is a subset of executive function, which includes many other functions like planning, task switching, um, et cetera. But again, I'm gonna be focusing on this conflict resolution part uh, called cognitive control. A quintessential cognitive control task is the color words truth task. So if you um, see the color word blue written in yellow, uh, and have to report the font color, um, you experience conflict between the representations blue and yellow, and cognitive control is thought to be important for resolving that conflict. And that's different from seeing the word yellow in yellow, where you don't experience that conflict, or a neutral stimulus that's a not, not a color word, um, and that, there also you do not experience any conflict. Our hypothesis is process specific. Um, so the idea is that cognitive control is useful, especially for resolving conflict between competing interpretations during sentence comprehension. Um, so this is a little bit different from other researchers who look at um, correlations between executive functions broadly defined and language broadly defined. So executive function could help in all kinds of ways. Uh, for example, it could help someone stay on task um, but our, our hypothesis is process specific, and this makes it more controllable and also more interpretable. Uh, so in particular, in the studies I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to uh, talk about the, the contrast between what I'm calling conflict sentences and no conflict sentences, and then explain what those are uh, in a second. So here are some typical stimuli that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the most common type of conflict uh, I'm going to talk about is what I'm calling syntax semantics conflict. So these are sentences like the doctor was treated by the patient. Um, so when you read or hear the sentence, um, you, the, the syntax is clear, it's unambiguous. It tells you that the doctor is the person getting treated by the patient. But of course, your semantic knowledge about the world tells leads you to expect the opposite, that the doctor would be treating someone rather than vice versa. Um, so uh, you experience conflict between the syntactic interpretation and the semantic interpretation. And again, the hypothesis is that cognitive control could be useful for resolving that conflict. And that's in contrast to the no conflict sentence, so a sentence like the patient was treated by the doctor, where the syntactic and semantic cues are in agreement, so there is no conflict. A second type of um, conflict I'm going to talk about is uh, garden path sentences. So uh, specifically sentences that have uh, main verb reduced relative clause ambiguity. So something like the experienced soldiers warned about the dangers conducted the midnight raid. Initially, comprehenders tend to interpret warned as the main verb of the sentence. So the experienced soldiers are the ones doing the warning. Um, and then when you get to conduct it, there is garden pathing that you experience conflict and you have to resolve the conflict by reanalyzing the sentence and uh, interpreting warned as part of a relative clause instead. Um, 
And again, that's in contrast to a no conflict sentence like the experienced soldiers who were warned, which is uh, unambiguously a red clause sentence. So you do not experience conflict in that case. Uh, and a third contrast is between uh, what I'm calling revision required sentences versus good enough compatible sentences. Uh, and so this is kind of, uh, this follows from Fernanda Ferreira's good enough comprehension work. Um, so when you have a sentence like, while the skipper sailed, the cargo ship veered off course, um, when you get to veered off course, theoretically speaking, you should experience conflict and you, uh, if you are really syntactically analyzing the sentence, you should uh, revise your interpretation to understand that the cargo ship is the beginning of a new clause. Um, but a lot of research has shown that people don't always do this. They stick with a good enough strategy. Uh, so in, in some cases, ending up with some kind of blended interpretation, like the skipper sailed the cargo ship and the cargo ship veered off course. Uh, and that's tenable in that case. So people just let that slide in effect and don't really deal with the conflict there. Um, but if you have a manipulation that forces revision or encourages revision, so that's the conflict sentence on top, uh, while, the, while the traveler sailed the dinghy stayed by the shore. Now the ending, the stayed by the shore, makes it less viable for you to hold on to traveler sailing the dinghy because how could it be staying by the shore if the guy is sailing it? Right. So, um, so this kind of ending might uh, encourage more revision. And, and again, the idea is that because conflict resolution is more required or encouraged in that case, uh, column to control might be more relevant uh, for the conflict sentence and the no conflict sentence. And again, I'm just referring to these using the same terminology just to keep it um, consistent. Um, Typical paradigms that my group and other groups use to look at the relationship between cognitive control and sentence comprehension. Um, first, you can look for correlations between a measure of cognitive control and a measure of sentence comprehension. And the prediction would be that people who are better at cognitive control uh, should show better sentence comprehension, especially when, this, when there's conflict involved. Um, we could also look for brain activation for conflict versus no conflict um, sentences, and you might expect to see that brain activation in regions that are typically involved in cognitive control tasks, so usually lateral and medial frontal cortices. Uh, and then a third type of paradigm that I and others have used is a more causal paradigm called conflict modulation. So here the idea is that we interleave um, Stroop and sentence comprehension trials. And if cognitive control is relevant for sentence comprehension, then the previous Stroop trial might modulate the subsequent sentence trial. So for example, if you see the color word blue in yellow, again, that should trigger conflict and activate cognitive control. Uh, and then that in turn should influence any sentence that comes soon after that cognitive control is activated. Uh, and that's different from the yellow and yellow, yellow case, a congruent case where there is no conflict and that, that does not activate cognitive control and therefore should have no effect uh, on the subsequent sentence. So this is a causal paradigm. If you find that effect because it shows that uh, cognitive control causally influences how you process the sentence. Um, so now we get to the title of the talk, right? So there's quite a bit of prior evidence for correlational and causal relationships between cognitive control and sentence processing in both neurotypical adults as well as PWA. Um, but the evidence is a, is a bit mixed. Uh, and also there's um, uh, some controversy about whether cognitive control is necessary or always used. Um, so from my perspective, uh, the issue isn't a a dichotomy, so it's not whether it's not just cognitive control is either used or not used. I think uh, the question is more about when is it used, for whom, and for what. Um, and so the main premise in this talk is that the utility of cognitive control for sentence comprehension varies um, according to several systematic factors. So first, we can expect it to vary based on individual differences. So some people have more cognitive control resources than others. And therefore, we would expect some variability based on that, uh, on whether cognitive control is used or not. Um, another difference could be that some people engage in more good enough comprehension versus others might be uh, more um, strict reanalyzers, right? people who actually revise their interpretation. That, again, will influence whether cognitive control is used or not. 
Um, a second type of factor that could influence um, whether CC is used, right, is task differences. So some contexts have more at stake and require more accurate comprehension. So some contexts uh, require that you can't, you can't just uh, slide by with good enough comprehension. And so you might expect differences based on that as well. Uh, so contexts that require more accurate comprehension should be more likely to engage columnar control. And lastly, stimulus differences could also um, impact this question. Uh, so some stimuli encourage or force more accurate comprehension, and therefore you would expect uh, variability based on that. Uh, so here's an outline for the talk. Uh, I'm gonna begin with um, some studies with neurotypical adults that get at these um, questions, and then uh, we'll move on to how these ideas might apply to agrammatism. So starting with individual differences, um, uh, this is an fMRI study that we did um, a few years ago. Um, healthy younger adults um, uh, read garden path sentences, especially main verb relative clause ambiguity sentences. So again, things like sentences like the experienced soldiers warned about the dangers conducted the midnight raid. Uh, and again, warned is initially likely to be interpreted as a main verb, and then you have to revise it to the beginning of a relative clause instead. So we um, had participants read these kinds of sentences, and we compared activation for relative clause ambiguous sentences to relative clause unambiguous sentences, so cases like the experienced soldiers who were warned that shouldn't generate um, conflict. So the idea is that the structure is the same, both are relative clause uh, sentences, but the RC ambiguous sentence uh, should generate conflict because it creates the garden path thing. So you go the wrong way the first time and then you have to revise yourself. Uh, and that's not the case for the relative plus unambiguous case. Um, okay, so we especially looked in uh, regions typically associated with cognitive control, so frontal cortex regions. Um, so that's what I'm showing you here. So left parse operculatus, left parse triangularis, left frontal orbital cortex, and then for contrast, a temporal region, so left MPG. Uh, the different bars are um, showing activation for a relative class ambiguous versus unambiguous, and then main verb ambiguous and unambiguous. So a conflict uh, sensitive signature would be showing more activation for relative class ambiguous sentences in particular over all three um, other uh, sentence types. And as you can see, we, we saw that pattern and left parse operculatus where we got that increased activation for relative plus ambiguous sentences, but we didn't see that in any of the other uh, regions of interest. So, so that's great. It confirms that, okay, it's something, a, a frontal region that's uh, associated with cognitive control, uh, it also shows sensitivity to the conflict that we um, manipulated. Uh, but in this study, we want to go a little bit further uh, and ask how uh, this activation uh, might adapt upon more exposure. So if a, a, if a listener or a reader keeps encountering these sentences, their brains should learn from those ex that experience, right? It should update those, uh, the syntactic expectations accordingly. Um, and so we manipulated that in the study. In the second run, the FM, in the fMRI scanner, in the second run, we had each verb appear in uh, uh, ambiguous and unambiguous sentences uh, four times. And we looked at whether uh, as you got more and more exposure to the verb in relative plus sentences, whether activation adapted um, accordingly. Um, and we found that it did. So what I'm showing you here is activation in parse, left parse operculatus. Uh, for um, relative plus ambiguous sentences versus unambiguous sentences. And at the bottom here, one, two, three, and four um, refer to the first time that you saw a verb in those structures, the second time that you saw it, and so on. Okay? Um, and what you can see is that the first and second times that people encountered relative plus sentences, there was that conflict sensitivity. You saw increased activation for um, ambiguous versus unambiguous sentences. But by the third and fourth exposures, uh, it's as if people's brains had adjusted to this. There's no longer um, increased activation for the ambiguous conflict case. Um, so this suggests that the left part superculares is um, adapting uh, to uh, language experience. 
Um, so as you encounter more difficult structures, it's, uh, it, it adapts and it maybe updates its syntactic expectations uh, based on exposure. Um, Okay, so of course we were also interested in cognitive control in particular, right? So we wanted to look at whether that adaptation was related to individual differences in cognitive control, and we found that it was. Um, so here on the x-axis, I'm showing you um, uh, Stroop scores. So each participant completed the um, a Stroop task, and we computed a representational conflict resolution score for each participant. So effectively reaction time for the incongruent trials minus the neutral trials normalized to the neutral trials. So higher numbers here um, on the x-axis uh, indicate poorer cognitive control, meaning you were slowed down by the incongruent trials, whereas smaller numbers indicate better cognitive control. And then in the y-axis, I'm showing you act, uh, the change in the activation in left part supracularis um, as with more exposure. So if, if activation, uh, the ambiguity effect or activation decreases over time, that indicates, so towards the bottom of the y-axis, that means more adaptation, whereas if it increases towards the top of the y-axis, it means less adaptation. And we found a significant positive correlation um, between current control and this change in activation. Uh, so effectively, those who are better at cognitive control show more adaptation. Those who are worse at cognitive control show less um, adaptation. So just to summarize that, um, these results suggest that people with better cognitive control uh, might be able to better revise initial misinterpretations and update their syntactic expectations accordingly. This is consistent with um, prior correlational evidence from neurotypical adults as well as phasia, but in this study, we went a bit further, right? It's not, it wasn't just showing that cognitive control impacts the processing of this sentence. It's suggesting that there might be a relationship between um, uh, cognitive control and how your brain adjusts to continued exposure and language experience um, via its role in revising uh, initial misinterpretations. Okay. Um, moving on to task differences, um, uh, recent, prior st recent studies have shown that there is conflict modulation. So this is where we interleave the stroop and sentence processing trials. Um, and um, so blue, the con incongruent stroop trial should activate cognitive control and influence the subsequent sentence, whereas congruent trials should not do the same. Uh, and so these previous studies have used the visual world paradigm um, and shown that, yes, we do get that kind of conflict modulation in behavioral accuracy and or eye movements. Um, so we wanted to uh, follow that up and uh, we did a web-based reading study. This was one of those pandemic babies, so that's why it's web-based. Um, and um, we, um, this is a pre-registered study, so we conducted a pilot experiment, did power analyses, and established the experimental procedures, pre-registered it, and then ran the experiment using the established procedures with new participants, so 104 participants. Um, so the, each participant completed two days uh, of testing. On day one, they did the conflict modulation paradigm, so interleaved troop and self-based reading. The conflict sentences here were syntax semantics conflict sentences, like in the studio, the artist was painted by the talented students. Uh, so the idea is that you're expecting artists to be painting something, uh, but painted by should trigger conflict. Um, and then after each sentence, they answered a question like, did the artist depict someone or was the artist depicted by someone? Uh, and half the time the questions had the correct answer is yes, and half the time they had the correct answer is no. So we actually got a sense for whether people did in fact revise and come to the correct interpretation. Um, and then on day two, uh, all participants com uh, completed a bunch of cognitive tasks. Um, so first to talk about this cognitive task, we had a bunch of, we had uh, some span tasks and we had a bunch of cognitive control tasks and exploratory factor analysis nicely separated them into working memory and cognitive control factors. So operation span and reading span loaded on to one factor and headers and the flanker task, the AXCPT task, and the stroop task loaded on to another factor. So I'm calling them the working memory and cognitive fa control factors respectively. 
Okay, so with respect to conflict modulation, did we find it? No. Um, so we did not find any consistent effect of the previous troop trial um, on reading times in the disambiguating region, which is what we would have predicted if there was conflict modulation. Um, and so this is discrepant with previous results, right? Uh, and so one open question is uh, task differences. So um, it's possible that uh, tasks that require overt responses and action planning, like in the visual world paradigm, um, might be more likely to engage cognitive control than something like passive reading. Uh, and in this context, I should mention that some other groups also have not found conflict modulation with other kinds of stimuli or paradigms. Uh, so there is some mixed results in this, uh, in this domain. Uh, with respect to relationship with cognitive control and correlation with the cognitive control factor, we did find a significant correlation uh, for ac comprehension accuracy. So what I'm showing you on the left here are the results from the pilot experiment. And then the, on the right is the results from the stage two, this pre-registered study. Uh, so effectively, there are replications of each other. Um, on the x-axis, here is comprehension accuracy. Um, and zero is over here, right? So uh, what you see is that there's a significant effect of sentence type, so incongruent sentences were less accurate than congruent sentences, as you might expect. There, is a sign there was a significant uh, correlation with the cognitive control factor, and that uh, was true even though we controlled for working memory in the same regression model. Uh, and we got similar effects uh, in the stage two study as in the pilot study. So to summarize the task differences part, uh, again, the, I'm suggesting that um, situations that require overt responses may be more likely to be modulated by cognitive control. Um, so task differences might be important. So here I want to just pause and make clear that, you know, the way I'm thinking about task differences is a little bit different from some previous literature on this, where some papers either implicitly or explicitly uh, uh, think of task differences as um, effectively meaning that the effects are not of interest, right? That the effects are some just artifacts related to tasks. I don't think about it in this way. I think naturalistic interactions also involve overt responses. Um, listeners make motor, verbal, and nonverbal actions in response to speech. So in real life too, language isn't just passive uh, comprehension. There is more at stake in some contexts than, than in others. Um, so I think the real job here is to not just ignore task differences, but really understand them and map them on to naturalistic situations. So I think task differences are interesting. Um, okay, and then the last um, factor I want to talk about are stimulus differences. Um, so sentences can differ also in the extent of conflict that they generate and the extent to which um, good enough comprehension or revised interpretation is necessary, right? So going back to the stimuli I talked about before, if you have a sentence like, while well, the man sailed, the vessel veered off course, you can potentially co-maintain man sailing the vessel and vessel veering off course, and you can kind of get by with good enough comprehension and leave, leave the conflict alone. Um, whereas if you have an ending like the vessel stayed by the shore, it, that's less tenable to co-maintain those two interpretations. So here the conflict has to be resolved. And again, the hypothesis is that the latter case is more likely to require cognitive control. So here uh, are the results. This was an fMRI um, study. Uh, and so people uh, read these kinds of sentences and then they answered a question like, did the man sail the vessel? Uh, and again, the good enough pattern is that people say yes, um, right? At least some of the time to the man sailing the vessel, indicating that they haven't fully revised their interpretations. Um, so here are the results uh, on the on the left. Here are the, are the accuracy results, on the right are the reaction time results. So in terms of accuracy, you see that the good enough compatible sentences show lower accuracy than the revision needed sentences. So this is showing that our manipulation worked, um, that people were more likely to revise and arrive at the correct interpretation when in the revision needed case than in the good enough compatible case. 
And on the right, uh, the reaction time results show that the good enough uh, sentences were slower. Um, people responded to them, the question slower in those cases than to the revision needed case. So, uh, so it's not the case that in the good enough case, people were uh, had lower accuracy because they were responding faster. In fact, they were responding slower, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they were less accurate. So, uh, and then it's the reverse for the revision needed sentences. So the revision needed sentences clearly triggered something um, that uh, made people more likely to revise and arrive at the correct interpretation. Um, so this is an fMRS study, but unfortunately, I don't have enough subjects. Uh, we don't have enough subjects analyzed uh, to tell you about the results today. Um, so what we are looking for is where in the brain is there more activation for revision required than for good enough uh, compatible sentences? And again, our hypothesis would be that frontal regions involving cognitive control should show that activation. But going beyond that, we're interested in variability again. Um, um, so people who show more activation uh, in those regions, um, whether or not that's correlated with better comprehension performance. Uh, so lateral and medium front cortices are the regions of interest here. But yeah, sorry, I don't have results. Stay tuned. We're hoping to write this up this summer. Um, OK, so that's the uh, sort of setting up, right? Uh, so. Uh, what exactly have we been doing with neurotypical adults and what does that suggest? And again, our results suggest that cognitive control involvement during sentence comprehension can vary uh, according to individuals cognitive control abilities. Uh, so that's what we saw in the adaptation um, study where cognitive control correlated with how much the left parsipicularis adapted. Uh, it can vary according to the task of the listener. So potentially there are differences between tasks that involve actions versus tasks that do not, at least overt actions. Uh, and then lastly, uh, it can also vary depending on the stimulus. Uh, so different stimuli might encourage or force conflict resolution more or less, and potentially all of these could um, interact. So how might all this apply to a grammatism? Uh, our working assumption is that um, people with aphasia are part of the same distribution as neurotypical adults. So the types of comprehension mechanisms and the variability in those mechanisms that apply to neurotypical adults will also apply to uh, PWA. So to look at this, we um, did some case studies. We uh, screened four participants. Um, for agrammatism. So specifically, people completed the Philadelphia comprehension battery. And so this is a sentence picture matching task. So you hear you hear a sentence and you see um, two pictures on the screen. Uh, these are all reversible sentences. Uh, but on some trials, you can um, uh, be accurate using lexical information alone. And on other trials, you cannot. So the critical trials are these non-lexical trials where uh, you might hear something like the man served the woman, and one picture is man serving woman, another one is woman serving man. And so you cannot do it lexically. You have to necessarily process the structural aspects of the sentence to get it right. Uh, so chance here is 50%. So as you can see, these four patients um, are all doing uh, uh, performing above chance when you can solve it using lexical knowledge. So they have basic lexical comprehension mechanisms, but they're all at chance when you have the non-lexical trials. Um, so in addition to the Philadelphia comprehension battery, um, we also gave them an expanded uh, comprehension test, which just had more trials per structure. So we had actives, passives, um, subject relatives, object relatives, and so on. Um, all of these are reversible sentences. So we expect the, all of these patients to be at chance, do poorly on these reversible sentences that require structural analysis. But we wanted to see people um, did worse on non-canonical structures than in canonical structures. And you see that that is um, true. Uh, so all of these patients have poorer accuracy on non-canonical sentences than on canonical sentences. Um, we also screen patients on production measures, so WAP fluency and uh, NAV sentence production priming. And we found that the patients P1 to P3 uh, had low uh, scores on those, again, going along with the typical understanding of agrammatism. But P4 uh, actually had um, quite a bit higher scores 
on those. Uh, but again, P4 also uh, fit the agrammatism profile on the comprehension task, but in production, they scored higher. So maybe they're uh, milder than the other three patients. Um, we uh, collected multimodal measures. So patients did four kinds of tasks. Um, so in the sentence picture matching uh, task, they um, heard a sentence and had to pick one out of four pictures using a touch screen. In the um, sentence plausibility judgment task, so this is based on the Safran et al. paper uh, from the 90s, uh, they heard a, a sentence uh, that might or might, might or might not make sense, so something like the meat bit the lion, and they had to say, does the sentence make sense, yes or no? So it's a plausibility judgment task. And then in the eye tracking task, they again did sentence picture matching, uh, but uh, while we track their eye movements. And then lastly, they did an ERP task where they uh, heard a sentence and then answered comprehension questions on a subset of the trials, just to make sure that they were paying attention. The, the comprehension questions weren't really um, overtly testing the conflict itself in order to keep it fairly passive. Uh, but we were primarily interested in their brain signals, their um, electrophysiological signals. Okay, so um, the sentences were uh, involved syntax semantics conflict. So um, sentences like the patient treated the doctor or the doctor was treated by the patient. So either the active or the passive. And these patients with agrammatism were predicted to have difficulty with these sentences, right? So uh, because they struggle with reversible sentences in general, but uh, in these cases, in addition to that, the semantic cues are pushing you in the opposite direction of what syntax is doing. Um, but the real question we were interested in is why, uh, why, might, why might they fail? So um, theoretically speaking, uh, patients could fail uh, because they have structure building, building deficits. So if they're not computing sy syntactic structure, they could have trouble with that, um, but they could also fail based on over-reliance on semantics. And this is somewhat independent from structure building because you might expect this even in neurotypical adults who don't have structure building deficits. In fact, we do see semantically based interpretations of errors in neurotypical adults. Uh, so patients might do, be doing that more. Um, and lastly, uh, given our interest in cognitive control, we hypothesize that at least some of these patients could be failing um, because they have conflict resolution impairments. So uh, they might be computing the syntactic interpretation and semantic interpretation, um, just like uh, neurotypical adults do, uh, but they might not be able to resolve the conflict between those two things if they have a cognitive control um, impairment. So the I'm showing you results from the first two tasks first. So the, on the left here is sentence picture matching. On the right is the plausibility judgment task. Uh, the patients are at the bottom, patients uh, P1 through P4. Um, and uh, the different conditions are the different bars. The critical bars here are the red bars. So those are the bars that contain conflict. So they are the cases like the patient treat to the doctor or the meat with the lion. And uh, so chance here, um, depending on how you compute it, right, uh, is could be something like 50% or 37.5%. Uh, but so, uh, but what you, we, we looked at whether patients are showing above chance um, accuracy and what you see here, especially on the red bars. And what you see here is that patients, the first two sets of patients, so P4 and P1, uh, are performing above chance on the, in the critical conflict case uh, in both sentence picture matching and plausibility judgment. So again, these patients were screened for agrammatism and they show the agrammatic comprehension profile in our screening, uh, but the, nevertheless, they succeed uh, in picking the correct picture for um, uh, sentences like the patient played of the doctor, right? Or saying that the meat with the lion, uh, it does not make sense. Um, so this suggests that they have some residual heuristics or some structure building uh, that can compete with uh, semantic cues that are pushing you in the opposite direction. So one point I wanna make is that there's variabilities that agrammatism is not a monolithic thing, uh, that some patients have some residual abilities that uh, allow them to overrule semantics if, if that's necessary. Um, in contrast, patients P2 and P3, as you can see here, the arrows show uh, the critical conditions. 
they are uh, the NS refers to not significant. So they're not significantly different from chance. So they're at chance in the critical conditions in both the sentence picture matching um, and the plausibility judgment task. So P2 and P3 are what you might have expected ahead for all patients, right? So they struggle when semantic cues conflict with syntax. Um, so the, again, the real question we were interested in is why, right? And we thought it could be the case that different patients are failing for different reasons. Um, so it could be that um, some patients are doing poorly because they're relying on semantics instead of syntax, right? And maybe not even computing the syntactic interpretation. So that would um, lead you astray here because they all involve syntax semantics conflict. Uh, but it could also be the case that some patients could fail because they're computing both syntactic and semantic interpretations, but cannot resolve competition between them due to cognitive control impairment. Um, and so I'm showing you the results for P3 here, um, right? So, the, uh, so spoiler alert, uh, the two patients are different. Uh, so the results for P3 first, uh, again, uh, this patient is at chance on the behavioral task on the conflict, in the conflict condition, um, but why are they at chance, right? So uh, in the eye tracking task, uh, so this is the figure on the left here. Um, the x-axis is showing uh, time from sentence onset, the y-axis is showing proportion of looks, and the two lines are looking to the target picture. So if it's patient treated the doctor, it would be patient treating the doctor, uh, and the reversal picture, so the opposite, so the doctor treating the patient. So the reversal is the semantically attractive interpretation, whereas the target is a syntactically correct interpretation. And what you see is, is this patient is looking uh, more at the reversal than at the target. So they're looking more at the semantic match than at the syntactic match. And on the right here, I'm showing you the um, ERP uh, results. Uh, so in this case, so again, to orient you, uh, negative, is, negative voltage is plotted on top. Uh, the red line is the conflict case. Um, so these were sentences like in the psych ward, the nurse was sedated by the careful doctor. So it's a nurse, as you might expect, would be doing the medical procedures then undergoing the medical procedures. And then the non-conflict case was uh, the patient was sedated, which is what you expect. Um, so uh, we had hypothesized that if patients were computing both types of interpretations and were detecting conflict between them, that we should see a P600 uh, in that case, as we do with neurotypical adults. Um, so, uh, so did P3 show that? Uh, no, P3 did not. In the 600, 800 millisecond window, there was no positivity for the conflict case compared to the non-conflict case. And this is an example frontal electrode here. Um, so both the eye tracking and the ERP results suggest that for this particular patient, it's what you might classically expect from agrammatism. They seem to be relying on semantics pretty much, and there is no evidence that they were computing the syntactic interpretation or detecting conflict between syntax and semantics. So they are going wrong because they're going with the semantic match. Sorry. Okay. And that's different from P2. So again, this, this patient also is at chance on behavioral tasks. So they're picking the, they are at chance for which picture they're picking or whether they're saying whether the sentence makes sense or not. Um, but their eye tracking and ERP patterns look different. So looking at eye tracking first, the leftmost um, graph, again, time from sentence onset at the bottom, uh, proportion of licks on the y-axis, uh, the solid line is a target and the dotted line is a reversal. So in contrast to P3, uh, patient two is showing more looks to the target than the reversal. So in other words, this patient is looking at the syntactically correct match um, over the reversal, uh, the semantic match, even though in, in their overt response, they are a chance for which picture they are picking. So there's some evidence that they're at least considering the syntactically con correct interpretation. Um, and then moving over to the ERP uh, results, again, the red lines are the conflict sentences, the black lines are the uh, no conflict sentences. And here in the 600 to 800 millisecond window, uh, we do see a positivity, um, but 
uh, we are running some additional analyses to check that there's some, seems like some of this effect could be present from earlier. So we are running some additional analysis to check that. Uh, but hopefully it's pretty clear that the pattern is very different from uh, P3. There's some um, evidence that there's some difference between conflict and no conflict sentences here that was not present for the other patient. So the question then is why is this person failing? So this person is looking at the uh, correct picture in the eye tracking and maybe is detecting conflict between the syntactic and semantic interpretations. So why is their behavioral performance at chance? Uh, our hypothesis is, again was that this might be due to a co uh, cognitive control impairment. And that's what I'm showing you in the rightmost uh, bar here. This is performance on the auditory Stroop task, um, specifically the contrast between neutral trials and incongruent trials. And again, an impairment in cognitive control would mean really lower performance on the incongruent trials compared to the neutral trials. And you see that that is true for P2, whereas P3 is in fact uh, at ceiling. They are close to 100% accurate um, in this task. So, P3's problem is not cognitive control. P3's problem is over-relying on semantics, whereas for P2, it seems likely that their problem is at least in part coming from a cognitive control impairment because they seem to compute the syntactic interpretation but are choosing the correct, not choosing the correct answer more than chance. Um, so just to summarize that, um, I've shown you some evidence that um, individuals with aphasia uh, might differ in why they fail at sentence comprehension, right? So uh, they, again, they all show an agrammatic profile, but the underlying mechanisms for why they fail might be different. And that these differences only became apparent when we were looking at this multimodally, right? They were not obvious from behavioral measures alone. So patients who look similar behaviorally might have different underlying um, deficits. And so we think this variability has implications for treatment. Um, so it could be the case that some patients have uh, residual cognitive control abilities, whereas others have more impairments. It could also be the case that some patients might have residual structural processing, whereas others might have more impairments. And again, these um, these differences might not be obvious if you just look at uh, behavioral performance. Uh, you might need other measures to tease them apart. Um, and then just like neurotypical adults, it could also be the case that there's within individual variability, there could be stimulus and task-based modulation of these um, processes. So how are we doing on time? Do I have five more minutes, Dirk? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I just want to quickly show you, right? So at least an example of this kind of stimulus variability within an individual. Um, so looking at the syntax semantics conflict sentences uh, that I've been talking about throughout, right? So patient treated the doctor, the hypothesis is that that should lead to slower reaction times than no conflict sentences like doctor treated patient. Uh, but we, when we tested 26 healthy older adults uh, to collect some norms on this, uh, we found that there was some variability between different stimuli. So um, only some sentence pairs showed the slowdown for the complex sentence more reliably than others. So specifically, um, 12 out of the 20 sentence pairs had mean slowdown greater than standard error of the mean. So this I'm calling uh, reliable conflict items. Uh, and then eight out of the 20 did not have this pattern. So there was a lot of variability um, across subjects and whether you, we got the kind of expected conflict slowdown pattern or not. And so those are classified as not reliable items. And so we are in the process of um, seeing whether or testing whether we can see conflict modulation in uh, persons with aphasia. Uh, so that's what I'm showing you here in one participant. Um, so the y-axis here is mean reaction time. The yellow bars are um, the reliable conflict items, the green bars are the not reliable conflict items based on control subjects. And um, so what you see in the highlighted portion is effectively conflict modulation. So uh, when you look at reaction time to the conflict sentence, uh, when it's preceded by a conflict stroop trial, people are, uh, this person is um, uh, faster than it when the sent same sentences were preceded by um, no conflict stroop trial. So that's conflict modulation. So experiencing a previous conflict stroop trial 
in some ways facilitated the processing of this conflict sentence. So you get that pattern for the reliable conflict items. But as you can see with the green bars, there is no such effect. Uh, there's no difference between the conditions. We've um, tested this person on in two separate tests. And it's, this is just to show you that that pattern is true across sessions. So in a second test also, you get you can see that people, the person got faster the second time around overall, right? But you still see that conflict modulation effect for the reliable items in yellow, and you don't see it for the not, not reliable items uh, in green. So there is some stimulus dependent variability as well within the same uh, person. So just to sum up, um, the main point I want to make is that variability is a signal rather than uh, noise. Um, that variability in comprehension mechanisms is to be expected because we expect to see it in neurotypical adults, but we also should expect to see it in persons with aphasia. And really studying this variability can be clinically and theoretically informative. Um, clinically, it's informative because we can customize the treatment um, based on the underlying source of the deficits. Again, people who look similar behaviorally but have different underlying problems might benefit from different kinds of treatment. Um, and theoretically, uh, the point I would make is that comprehension broadly is not just one single way of doing things. I think there's plenty of evidence in the neurotypical literature that there are different kinds of cues and heuristics and ways in which people can uh, interpret a sentence. Um, and so really understanding this variability, I think will also um, inform our theories of sentence comprehension. And I'll stop there. This is just the main idea screen from before. I'll, I'll just keep that up there and then I'll take any questions. Thank, thank you so much, Malathi. Um, we have, I hope, I hope you can hear our audience. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Let me change this a little bit. So that, okay. Let's take a look, see if we have some questions from our own room. I'm going to turn the camera so you can see our own room. If you have a question, I think the computer can probably pick you up. So everybody from here. You, yeah, Ruth. Well, it's thanks for a very interesting talk. Um uh, when you talk about cognitive control and then uh Cognitive control as applied to sentence processing. I wonder if you could think of control mechanisms that are used for sentence processing and different or special compared to more general mechanisms. So, uh, for example, in uh, lexical semantics, um, some people have proposed this idea that there is some people semantic control, some area that is designated as semantic. That strikes me as Strange claim that there are separate mechanism dedicated just to manipulate words and it is different from any other kind of So I am wondering what is your take on that? And if the same general mechanism is being used for this sentence tasks or if it's something special? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. I, I can't completely clearly hear the audience there, but I think I heard enough of Ritz's question to answer it. Let me know if that's not the case. So I think the question was whether the semantic control mechanisms are similar or different from what I'm talking about here. Um, I think the jury's out on that. So um, I've uh, so broadly speaking, I think they are the similar kind of mechanism and probably housed in nearby regions uh, in the frontal cortex. Uh, but I think there is the possibility that there's some subspecialization depending on which part of the frontal cortex, for example, we, I mean, yeah, we have some uh, evidence, but these may not. So phonological control and semantic control and uh, something like sentence level control might not necessarily be the exact same thing because in terms of the networks and which regions are involved, we expect some functional connectivity differences maybe but I think of them as similar in the broad framework. They're all cognitive control selection, uh, negotiating competition kinds of mechanisms, but they might be, they're operating on different representations. So at the very least, we expect connectivity to be different. Does that answer your question? Okay. Another summary. 
I'm going to turn it over to our online audience, Manati. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, a, I think, a related question uh, by uh, Kirana Tsapkini. Uh, great talk, Malathi. Sorry I missed the beginning, but how do you define cognitive control? Do you think it is internal at the sentence level, domain specific, or external to it, and including Stroop tasks, for example, uh, so uh, domain general, or is there a control mechanism with internal and external components? And then a, a follow-up by Alexandra Roman Irizari. Uh, I have a similar question. How is your definition of cognitive control similar or different from cognitive control definition of goal maintenance, proactivity versus reactivity as measured by the ACTS continuous performance task? Thanks. Okay. Um, so with respect to Kiran's question, I think I have some extra slides. Let's see if I can. Um, so in this neurobiology of language paper that I talked about first with the adaptation, we actually looked at uh, multiple demand network uh, versus the language network as defined by Federenko, right? So, uh, and, and they both showed adaptation over time. So both of them adjusted activation as people were exposed to more complex sentences, but in different ways. So in the multiple demand network, um, first of all, activation for the sentences was lower than for, base, for the baseline task, uh, as opposed to the language network regions, the activation was higher for the sentence task versus the baseline. The second pattern that we found was that the language network, I mean, and I'm, I'm putting square, um, scare quotes, I don't really mean to do that, but I'm only doing that because I'm not necessarily signing on for calling that language network. I'm kind of agnostic about that, um, but it's different. So we found different patterns in the MD network versus what's called the language network, uh, where the language network showed verb specific adaptation. So it, it specifically adjusted based on the verbs that you were exposed to in the relative plot structures, whereas the multiple demand network showed verb general adaptation. So I think cognitive control, so my answer to Kirana's question is that both types of cognitive control, there could be some language internal mechanisms that are that show more psycholinguistic profiles, like things like verb specificity, that it's tracking verb bias in effect. Um, and then there could be gender purpose cognitive control mechanisms that can be useful for adapting to the task. Like you know where the task is, you are getting faster at just doing the task, uh, task-based adaptation. Um, and then with respect to the second question, reactive versus proactive cognitive control. Yeah, in this talk, the types of things we're talking about is reactive cognitive control. In particular, so you experience a conflict and you react to that conflict and resolve it, right? You don't know that it's coming. Um, so yeah, that's. Okay, thank you very much. Then we have a question from Varvara. Uh, thank you for your talk. For your web-based study, how come you decided to do correlations for your accuracy results and not regression like for reaction times, like a logistic regression? Oh, they're both, they're actually both regressions. Yeah, so they both had um, working memory, cognitive control, simultaneous regression. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I had a question that um, I think is a hard one, but it's it's one that I um, think about or struggle with sometimes in, in similar work, right? So from the perspective, so I completely agree that it makes sense to not look at agrammatism, first of all, as a monolithic thing, right? So that, that makes total sense. And there are different underlying problems that can lead to surface uh, behavior that is very similar. Mm -hmm. So however, so from the perspective of functional communication, just daily communication and functioning in daily life, it seems that this lexical semantic approach or, or the good enough approach, right, works pretty well in most cases, right? So how, how careful should one be by um, discouraging that behavior in a sense, right? And starting to train um, complex processing using cognitive control. Let's say that that will be one of the treatments that you would be about to propose, right? Mm -hmm. um, with a, a, with the risk that that makes things more complex than they perhaps need to be in normal daily functioning, where of course you're not confronted by 
sentences like while the soldiers um etc right yeah um yes so um so i think i think about this something like what peter hagrid has proposed right so it, it i don't think these the using cognitive control is just about these kinds of complex stimuli right there are there are contexts in which if you're having a meeting with, if you're going for an interview or you're giving a faculty talk, right? That it's sort of the stakes are higher than if you're an audience in a talk and you can kind of just get the rough idea. If you're not gonna ask a question or anything, you can kind of get by with good, good enough comprehension, but if you're actively engaged in some kind of um, high stakes activity where you're communicating, you, I think you might need cognitive control more. Um, if you are engaged in poetry, you might need phonological control more, right? If you're engaged in uh, something more pragmatic, you might need pragmatic control more. So I think these are all, they, I, they have analogs, I think, in real life situations. And of course, there is work to be done to tie these things to those real life analogs. But I, I think, uh, so that's one answer to your question that um, these sort of high stakes thing probably do happen in real life as well, where you might need current control. The other, um, answer the question about whether I, I don't think of this as we're forcing people to use I mean, even if we gave cognitive control treatment it's the idea isn't to encourage it right the idea is to actually cater it to the person so depending on whether the person is trying to use cognitive control right uh, so if they are competing two different interpretations and trying to resolve conflict between them then maybe we can facilitate that right so I think uh, people could just differ <laughs> in how they process things. Some people want to be more syntactically correct maybe than others. Uh, and so I, I, I don't think of this as changing someone's way of processing, but more that facilitating what they're trying to do in some cases better, yeah. Thank you so much. I think that makes a lot of sense. We, we have no further questions from online and I'm looking at our room. Nothing else came up. So thank you so much, Malati. Uh, really you. enjoyed your talk. Uh, thanks for coming. And um, audience, I hope you join us again in two weeks' time for Julie Wombo's talk on uh, May 5th. Bye. Bye.